Chat with Traders episode 161 is brought to you by AIG. You see a skyscraper going up? You know what AIG sees? AIG sees life insurance and retirement solutions protecting the crew, business insurance covering companies around the globe, and career opportunities for up and comers. You see the skyscraper. AIG sees the people and companies inside are ready for whatever comes next. Learn more about AIG insurance solutions and careers at AIG.com slash podcast. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast hosted by Aaron Fifield. Hey crew, what is up? I know it's been a minute since I've last put out a new episode. If you're curious why that is, I did write about it on my blog, aaronfirefield.com. There's been some big changes in my world as of late. I'm going to be dialing back the episode frequency as a result of some of these changes. Uh, So instead of there being like a set schedule where I release an episode every fortnight or, uh, you know, before that, it was every week. You know, things are going to be a little more randomized, if you will. But if you follow me on Twitter at Chat with Traders, that is my handle, or subscribe at chatwithtraders.com slash subscribe, you'll always know when new episodes are coming out. They're just going to be a little less frequent than what they have been, okay? I won't go into it too much here, but like I said, if you're interested, check out the post where I write about these things in detail, aaronfirefield.com. You'll see it there. On this episode, I got to catch up with Mike Agney. I know some of you will be well acquainted with Mike. I first interviewed him last year in New York. That was in person for a live event. And then I had him on the podcast in August last year too. Mike's trading experience runs deep in bonds, fixed income and treasuries, also index futures and options. And for a long time, he was a prop trader at the renowned Transmarket Group. And I might just add, Mike writes a really good newsletter, which you can subscribe to for free at chatwithtraders.com slash Mike. Uh, That will redirect you where you can uh, join the mailing list. Uh, Catching up this time, we talk relative value trading, the recent pickup in volatility and regime changes, risk parameters, technical analysis, capitalizing in a bear market, and a little bit about cryptocurrency markets too. Uh, In some ways, this episode is a little different than normal because we spoke about recent market events and his thoughts on the current market environment and bit of an economic outlook moving forward. But remember, this is not advice. Do your own research because you are responsible for your own decisions. And there is just one last thing which I've got to tell you about. And then I promise we'll cut to the episode. I'm going to be putting on another live podcast event in Sydney very soon. It's looking like it's probably going to be the later part of May. And I can tell you, I have a very special guest who is considered somewhat of a legendary trader here in Australia. More details about this soon. Okay, please welcome my buddy, Mike Agney. Yeah, so that's that, that that's about it, man. You know, just trying to keep that all straight and trying to not let it affect too much of your thinking. And, uh, you know, that's... That's about it. Cool, cool. Well, um, I'm glad to be chatting with you again. I mean, I've been meaning to just catch up with you in general. So I guess um, you know, we can we can kill two birds with one stone by um doing another podcast. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, let's uh let's just sort of hit the record button and get going. Um, we'll probably go for about 50 minutes or so. Okay. And then I've actually got to head off to work, <laughs> which feels kind of strange to say. Oh yeah, so you're doing the um, you're you're trading and and doing this as well, right? You're still doing that. Or you're risk manager somewhere, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, my my actual title is trader manager. Uh, so yeah, that involves risk and you know a whole bunch of other things. Uh, but yeah, I'm essentially, as the title sounds, managing a group of traders at, at a prop firm in Sydney here. So 
uh i'm now living in sydney yeah oh nice how's your weather how's your weather down there right now uh it's all right it's all right i mean we're still uh i think we're sort of on the way out of summer uh but you know it's nice uh i went to the beach on the weekend we live really close to the beach now and you know we're certainly spoilt for choice with uh beaches all up the coast from where i am in sydney yeah no it's it's good (laughs) <laughs> oh, awesome. I, I, we just got snow this morning, so I just can't believe oh, no. it. it. It's so annoying. The weather's terrible. Um, it, it's like just so erratic and it shouldn't be snowing in the middle of April. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. So that's out of character. Yeah, no. And it's like 28 degrees outside. So <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it's absurd. Yeah. Why do we live in Chicago? I don't know, but uh, the beach sounds nice. <laughs> yeah. Complete opposites, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I heard you're doing an MBA program. Um, When did you start that? So, yeah, I started last August at the Illinois Institute here in Chicago, and it's an all-day Saturday program, so it's like a two-year MBA program. Okay, and what got you into that? Uh, You know, I talked to a professor there. I was really interested in going like a couple years back, and it just the timing wasn't right. And finally, I'm like, you know what, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. And I kind of want a little bit more of um, to get into the public finance arena where you're kind of like consulting pension funds and trying to figure out a way to merge the public and private partnerships to kind of come up with solutions. Because what's working here in Illinois is uh, is well, basically nothing's working here in Illinois, but nobody wants to make the tough choices. So I view that as a very optimal um, future in terms of consulting and maybe even managing capital um, and, and in ways that they wouldn't normally think, you know, that are viable. So I felt like going back to school and learning more of, um, you know, just the business acumen as well as, um, you know, maybe from a technical logical standpoint, you know, a little bit more background on public finance. And so that's kind of what got me interested. So a uh, professor actually talked me into going. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. it was really and cool. Yeah. 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 So you've been enjoying it. Uh, yeah, you know what? It, it's it's time consuming. I'm not going to lie. Um, it does take, you know, some planning and, you know, the classes are very good, very in depth and I'm learning a lot. It, it's just managing the time of doing it is is another ball game. You know, you're trying to, you know, create a CTA and, and do all these other things and live a life and have a family. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> not enough hours in the day. I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but you know what? I, I kind of realize that no, you can always put off something, which is strange, you know, like you can always say, you know, I'll do it at this point in time. But in reality, I don't think it ever gets any easier, you know, and it's always like, and you know, you kind of just got to keep moving ahead. I mean, you know, life will just pass you by. So you just kind of got to keep forging ahead and accomplishing small little uh, wins here and there and, and keep moving forward. Completely, completely. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've certainly started noticing the same myself. And do you think this MBA is going to help with uh, launching your CTA when that when that time comes? Um, yeah, no, I kind of didn't really look at it in that respect. I mean, it'll help me understand um, how to formulate the business model a little bit better and exactly what kind of target market I need to focus upon, which I do believe it's going to be the pension fund area. And trying to make these guys understand the reality of the situation, how to actually combat it. You know, I even see it on the local level here in my own little town. And it's like these guys are going, they're out of control with this debt. And, you know, eventually you got to stop and realize that, you know, things are going to have to change. And so I figured with this program, it gives me a, a lot better, more, you know, a lot advanced in a micro look at, at how to solve these problems. So, um, like my first class was like this Excel analytics and I didn't, you know, I kind of know Excel and I, I get into this thing and I get into this class and I'm like, holy cow, this is super tough. <laughs> I, was, I was like, man, if this program's like this, I don't know if I'm going to last, but you know, I learned so much and it's like, they're so dedicated to, to making you understand the curriculum and, and going out of their way, the professors there that, it, you know, I really, it was difficult, but I enjoyed the, the challenge, you know? Yeah, oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. And, and how how have you been going with your, you know, I remember last time we spoke, you were sort of really focused on building out your track records so that at some point when the time is right, you can start your CTA. How's all that going? 
Yep, exactly. So that's kind of where I was at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, and I'm ready. I've got the lawyers working on submitting all that to the NFA, which we should be doing this week um, and creating that. And then I'm working with Capital Trading Group in terms of seeding and uh, talking to allocators. So, and that's another thing that I figured I needed to do was you, you really need to work with somebody um, because you can't do it all, right? You can't, you can't, at least I figured that out. You can't, you can't be the trader, you can't be the manager and you can't be the equity rate. You can't, you cannot do it all. So, um, Nell Sloan at Capital Trading Group has been pretty instrumental in helping me in that arena and, you know, just in getting, getting contacts and, and seeing exactly what they want, what they're looking for. And, you know, the track record's a big part of it, but your connections are also a very big part. So that's kind of where I'm at now, focusing upon that. And, you know, and it's a lot, you know, going, there's a lot involved in it. So, um, you know, I'm taking it slow and, you know, make sure covering all the bases and, um, you know, hopefully things will get ramped up here in the next month or so. Yeah, cool. And I should point out that Neil was actually on uh, Chat with Traders podcast a little while back. Uh, I don't remember exactly what episode that was, but um, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah, she she's great. Yep. Yeah, yeah. She was really interesting to talk to, actually. Like, obviously, uh, given her background and what she does, we just spent the whole episode talking about actually how to start a CTA and the sort of the hoops you got to jump through and how to do it right, mistakes and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, she's got such a great experience in the industry and a lot of connections. So, you know, it's, she's kind of invaluable in that regard. So, really pleased to be working with her. Yeah. And do you have a couple allocators lined up or, you know, potentials at the stage? Y- y- yeah, I actually do. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of like this feast or famine kind of thing. It's been kind of strange. Um, you know, you're kind of like a nobody for a while and then you start meeting people and you start getting your name out there and take a couple meetings. And then, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, your name's out there and, you know, it's like you got to pick and choose now. And because, you know, if you, you're, it's, it seems like, you know, they kind of want to, uh, I don't want to say exclusivity, but I guess that would kind of be it. Um, but that's kind of a learning lesson for me too, you know, how to, how to actually, on board these agreements and commit, you know what I mean? Cause I'm not really, it, that's not really my forte, but it's something I'm going to have to learn and be a part of. But yeah, I definitely have a couple lined up and uh, some choices to make in the next uh, two months. Okay. Okay. Oh, hope it all goes smoothly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're good problems, Aaron. They're, they're good problems. It's just, you know, and that's a hard part too, because you don't really know the right choices. I've been burnt in the past kind of with kind of committing to things and it's very tough and it's vetting things and, 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 you know, you don't really know, but you know what, if you don't put yourself out there, you don't take the chance, you're never going to know. So, you yeah. know, what do they say? Fail moving forward. Is that how it goes? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is it? Fail what? Fail moving forward. <laughs> Fail moving forward. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we were emailing uh, to, to set this up, uh, you'd mentioned in your email that you'd been uh, refining your algorithm for multiple global macro products. I thought that was interesting because I remember back to our last conversation, you know, you weren't a fully automated trader and perhaps you're still not. Um, but when you talk about refining your algorithm, I mean, it, it kind of sounds as though there's been a few changes since we since we last spoke. I, is that fair? Yeah, no, I guess it's fair to say. But you know, I, I'm I'm a lot of dis- you know, basically my main relative value trade is is discretionary, but the execution on it's systematic in some ways. And what I've found is, you know, if I'm concentrating on just like the fixed income area, I have everything set up for that. But if I'm going more global macro and I'm integrating, you know, different, you know, asset classes, maybe I'm getting more involved in like the uh, not just the S&P, but, you know, indexes in general and oil and energies and you're moving into metals and you're, you know, you're so you have these things that I'm not really, you know, don't want to say that I'm not an expert at trading, them, you know, because I'm not. But they do correlate and they do bring in the each each contract brings its own valuation and its own risk. So that's, you know, when I'm refining things, I need to take those into consideration in the overall risk model. So I have to first create like parameters and rules and um, 
try to, you know, figure out exactly how they'll play into the overall portfolio because it's not just fixed income five year to 30 year and, a, and an S&P trade. You know what I mean? So there's a lot more involvement in, I think my growth in that area is more towards a portfolio management and managing risk because I think, you know, as much as a, a good trader doesn't want to ever like, you know, want to say I ever have a big loss or, or you, you, you don't know how to handle something. If you set up these rules and these parameters, you kind of at least gives you a little guidepost to follow. And, you know, I I am a discretionary trader, but there's systematic things that you can put in place to kind of, you know, advance your processes. And that's kind of what I mean by doing that is, is kind of incorporating all of that and, um, moving away from just a fixed income centric to an overall global macro model, because that's kind of where I'm going to need to be. Okay. Yeah. And this is interesting because, Fixed income has been like your world for the last, what is it, 15, maybe 20 years or so. Yeah. To to now start, I know you've probably always had these other products on your radar, but to actually start actively trading in them, I, I, you know, I I appreciate that's, that's a big step, right? Yeah, it is. And it's not to say that, you know, I'm not, you know, my core is still relative value fixed income. That is the core. But but I want to, you know, get more involved into a global macro product that may incorporate these other things uh, because, um, you know, not that correlations stand up, you know, across time periods all the time. But, you know, you you really want to be, you know, diversified and kind of flexible enough to where, okay, I don't know, gold looks good here. I want to be able to take advantage of that. But in terms of a relative trade. I don't trade it every day, but if I have parameters set up and I know, you know, I can look back historically and do some relative value on it and some historical study and say, okay, well, this is my risk. I know what I'm, I know a general move. I know it's going to move this far and, you know, so I can adjust my size accordingly to, to take advantage of it. Um, because like, you know, the worst thing I want to do is, you know, and and I don't want to say I'm going to actively trade it because that might not be the case. I'm just looking for the best, you know, the best outlet for my vision and what I feel is on a global macro level, how things are going to tra- transpire and the best risk adjusted trade. It might not be the bonds. It might be long, going long gold. You know, you never know. Uh, and just so we don't lose anyone, uh, and in case anyone hasn't heard uh, our previous episode, can you just explain what relative value is and, you know, the, the sort of scenarios which you are trading? Um, yeah, so the way that I view relative value is in my world of fixed income arbitrage is um, I trade, let's just say, a U.S. Treasury security, five-year actual on-the-run cash, and uh, I'll spread that off into a, a CME group treasury future. And so in terms of relative value, I know the historical models of these spreads and how they trade and how they react given a certain type of interest rate environment. And so my my trading will be based upon that relative value that that you know my system may say like you know it's overvalued or it's or it's cheap and I'll put on a trade accordingly based upon whatever the parameters I have set up for my relative value and I'll go long or short. So that's basically how I view relative value and it's not to, you know, it's not specific to a time frame. So you can trade short term, get in and out, or you could say, okay, I like this trade for the next couple of weeks. You know, if, if interest rates are going to stay here, maybe have a parallel shift, uh, maybe the curve is going to continue to weaken and, and um, fall, then this, this, this bond should react in this manner. And like I said, nothing holds true. And that's the thing about trading. It's like an art. You know, if it was that easy, you could just create an algorithm and say X plus Y equals, you know, this, but it, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, you have to you have to make sure your your trading is, you know, flexible, and that's kind of why I like the discretionary aspect of it. I do like the systematic aspect of an automatic um, execution because the algorithms out there will not let you execute if you're not fast enough. So um, you'll you'll always have that issue going forward. But in terms of relative value, it's more of a study against historical relationships in my mind of how one asset reacts to another. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that, that's a good way of putting it. Now, how has your trading changed um, since this recent pickup in volatility uh, kind of starting in February in equity markets? Uh, has it had any effect on, on what you are doing? Um, yeah, I think it's kind of uh, made me pull back a little bit, I want to say. Um, I don't want to say I want to increase as the volatility is rising because I don't necessarily um, – 
I think that's the smart thing to do unless you really know we're at a different, uh, you know, the, the ball game's changed. I mean, obviously the ball game's been straight up equities market and the volatility's increased because of the VIX and um, all the mistakes that some of these groups have made in trading that and creating products around that VIX. But um, the buy the, the, the dip mentality, I think, is kind of uh, taken a little bit of hit. And it's been that way since the end of last year. But in relative terms to my trading, I've definitely pulled back because I don't, um, given starting the, the CTA up, I can't afford to kind of have a, a big drawdown and create kind of havoc at this point. You know what I mean? <laughs> So I don't want to say the volatility has been the cause of that, but definitely the timing of, of what I'm doing right now and trying to get this up and running is, is definitely uh, forced me to realign risk with uh, what I'm trying to do. When you say pull back, do you mean that you've been cutting your size or that you've been trading less actively? Both less actively and um, cutting size. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it's more and it's more of a timing thing. It's not just like some traders will say, oh, yeah, volatility is great. I can just, you know, the options are moving around. And yeah, I would generally agree with that. And but you're really, you know, it's never even in my career, it's never really changed my my trading style very much. It's more, if anything, it's maybe um, do a little bit more digging when these things happen and try to figure out exactly like, OK, is this a, is this a sustained uh, vol event or is this something that's just somebody figured out how to game the uh, bang the close so you know and, and get people caught one way and that's just a one-time event or it has something really changed so uh, that I'm more analytical I think you know that from me and talking and more fundamental and trying to figure things out before I start jumping in and making big bets on something I want to know if the regime has changed and um, it's really strange I think we're in a very and, and that could be another reason why too I don't trust the market right now. I, I think we're getting a very um, – we're, we're with the Federal Reserve and the way that it is and the way the U.S. interest rate market is, I think we're at a very crucial point in them deciding on where they really want this to go. And I think cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin is having a big effect on that as well. I, I think they see the writing on the wall and, and things can't – you can't just have debt forever. So so I'm kind of – you know I don't want to say fearful, but I know the risk is picking up and I, I'd rather readjust and, and take time to uh, swallow it all. Okay. Is there a certain type of market environment or a certain condition which you do best in? Yeah, more calm. I would say not more calmer, but markets that make sense. Is that is that kind of odd? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do any markets make sense? But no, more generally like, okay, if we're doing something fundamental like the Federal Reserve's raising interest rates, the yield curve should flatten, right? So that's okay. I get that. And that should, you know, the problem with it is, is do you trust the stock market? Because now you're really up. It's not like the old days where you had, you know, I, I, it's not a free market. As much as people want to think it's not, it's a central bank driven market. And they have told us time and time again that we are all in and this, this, we're not, we can't let it fail. So it makes it very difficult if you've got a bias like that and, and you know that they, they really can't raise rates. Like I, I know they really can't raise rates, but they're going to do it. Now, how high they get, I don't know. But it makes it difficult, you know, if you're trying to play a more longer term macro game to kind of structure something. So I, I'd say a good environment is kind of like a, um, a steady, steady daily move, not something where you get like up 40 in the S&P and down 40 the next day. That's not a good, that's not a good environment for me. Right. So, so when did the, la the markets last kind of make sense to you, would you say during 2017? Yeah, 17 wasn't bad. I think towards the end of it, I, and I really, I don't want to blame it on cryptocurrencies. Maybe it's the Fed and the combination of both, but you can definitely see the volatility pick up at the, at the, at the end of the begin, end of last year and the beginning of this year. I mean, January was a huge month for equities and I didn't buy that one bit. Like I didn't, I didn't think that that would, that should have ever happened. And then you, you know, because it just, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's like almost euphoric and almost top, top ish. And I went to this, uh, Chicago Economic Summit here, and it was packed. I mean, there was thousands of people there on like a freezing cold Monday like morning, I think it was. And I couldn't, but it was wall to wall people. And it was, a, you know, it was very good. They they had some really good speakers there um, and and um, Art Laffer and Diane Swank. And, and it's it's like everybody was bowled up. Everybody's like, oh, they, uh, Dow's going over 30,000, like 90% of the room. And I'm like, okay, really, this is this is what we're we're doing. I mean, you know, five percent GDP calls. I'm like, come on. So, you know, you're up against this 
this kind of ideology that is central bank driven that nobody thinks it can fail. And I'm always more of kind of like the contrarian, but I'm not a bearish kind of person. Like I don't, I, I just more fundamental. I'm more like, can we keep increasing the, the debt side of the balance sheet as equity prices rise? Can companies continue to just buy back their stock and, and raise their earnings per share by decreasing their shares? I mean, can it, yeah, maybe it can. And that's the reality of it. But I'm more looking at from a, from a U.S. fixed income perspective and saying, OK, well, we, we're gonna, we can't just increase our debt a trillion bucks every quarter. You know what I mean? So then I'm like, well, well how does that affect the bond market? How are we can interest rate? I mean, are they really going to flatten this thing to, to be inverted? I mean, maybe they can. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. But no, I really think that the regime change has happened. And um, so I, I think it's a good time for, for me to launch a CTA product because I think there's going to be a lot of uncorrelated uh, returns coming and people are going to be dumbfounded about like, well, how, how could that happen? Well, profitability for me, but I, I'd rather, you know, back to your question about, I'd rather just have a market that made sense. Um, I think the timing is getting better. And I, I think, you know, not that the volatility needs to pick up for a sustained profitability for me, but I, I'd rather, you know, back to your question about, I'd rather just have a market that made sense. This episode of Chat with Traders is brought to you by Proper Cloth. You know Proper Cloth, they've been a great sponsor in the past. If you're a fella, then I'm sure you know the struggle of finding a dress shirt that fits perfectly and also looks awesome. It's tough going. Like the sleeves are too short or it's either too tight in certain areas, whatever it is. That's why you've got to get over to propercloth.com where you can easily create a custom shirt size in a matter of seconds by answering 10 simple questions. Choose from over 20 collar styles, 10 cuff styles, and 500 fabric styles, from classic to business to casual. Customize the size and customize the style. Each shirt, custom made by Proper Cloth, guarantees a perfect fit meaning that if somehow your shirt doesn't fit perfectly, then they will remake it for free. These shirts start at just $80, so you've got no excuse to wear a shirt with a sloppy fit, especially because if you go to propercloth.com slash chat trade and enter the gift code chat trade, you'll save $20 on your first shirt. I know that coupon sounds a little weird uh, but it will save you 20 bucks propercloth.com slash chat trade now you said before that uh the fed can't raise interest rates but they're going to do it anyway what did you mean by that well if you look at um like the fed funds now uh their top of their range is 175 um so I, I know on a relative value, like I'll go back to that again, and you look historically, um, if they want to really stall the economy, if they really think it's getting overheated, they'll need, to, they'll need to get that Fed funds up above the 10-year rate. So you're talking close to 275 right now, so another 100 basis points. That's four more hikes. And by that time, the long end won't believe that they're doing that, and they'll say, well, you know, over the course of time, the you're going to have to cut these things back down. So then the long end will start to really flatten the curve because the long end won't move and it'll be the short rates that are, that are increasing. So they'll try to do this and why, you know, maybe they, I don't even know why they're doing it because inflation doesn't seem to be out of control, you know, in general. Um, but they want to get that short rate up. And what they're doing is it's a, almost like a stealth QE because every 25 basis point hike that they do, they're giving the banks another 5 billion bucks a year for nothing. So, um, so it's kind of like when they say they're shrinking their balance sheet. Well, on the flip side, they're also queuing close to 50 billion a year to the banks. And that's a lot of money. You know, back, I keep talking about this, but I remember LTCM blowing up and it was two and a half billion bucks or three billion. And it was like the end of the world. But now they're printing that every day. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's really weird, but nothing's really changed, Aaron. That's the weird thing. Nothing's really changed. All that's changed is you've blown valuations way past uh, nominal support, nominal fundamental organic economic support. Yeah. When LTCM blew up, is that all? That, they must have cost more than that. Uh, no, I think, well, maybe at the high end, $4 billion, but I know they lost two 
off the bat. And once word got out, it probably, you know, it, it, it I think their total equity was like close to three and a half billion. No, it was wasn't that, more than that. That seems really small. Low? Yeah. In the well, scheme of things. Yeah. 1998, it uh, apparently was going to bring everything down, but you know, I, I agree with I agree with you. And that's why fundamentally in the logical person that I am, I'm like, no, nothing's changed since 98. I mean, the relative wage here in this country is what's probably the same, you know, and yet they're printing, a, you know, the ECB and BOJ, uh, you know, 60 billion a month. Can you imagine? Like, well, what's changed? Nothing. You're just enriching the ultra, ultra wealthy to blow up these asset prices. That's all you're doing. You're not changing the general dynamics of, a, of the equilibrium of an economy. Now, as I brought up uh, the volatility pickup uh, starting back in February, or uh, you mentioned it probably started a little bit earlier, but let's talk about the VIX and, and the ETF that was linked to the VIX, which blew up. You'd mentioned to me, going back to uh, referencing an email, uh, that you were at the office of LJM Partners in Chicago on, on the day that kind of shit hit the fan. Yeah, yeah, it was where, well, Nell Sloan, they, she works for Capital Trading Group. And, um, you know, I don't know how much I can actually talk about this, to be honest. But, um, you know, they share, I, I guess that's probably public knowledge that they share an office, I would assume that you can get an address from anywhere. But since I work with Capital Trading Group, and um, I write their weekly newsletter for them, I was in there that afternoon. So, yeah, it caught me by surprise. I didn't know what was going on. Obviously, I'm not a part of that group. I'm just in her office discussing my newsletter. But that's what I, you know, when I talk about when I'm in, I was in that same office at that, that day that that happened. You know, I don't have any access to what they were doing. You know, I'm not in their office at LGM, but Capital Trading Group's office is, is in the same, it's on the same floor. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you just talk a little bit about kind of what went down? Um, yeah, well, what I think went down and everything's public knowledge at this point. I mean, anything you can read in Reuters or Bloomberg, I mean, it's all out there. It's these products that are created, these VIX, which, you know, it's, and it's, it's so strange to me because the VIX is a theoretical construct, right? It, it's a mathematical formulation. So it's not an actual physical product. Like when I create a, you know, if I can, if I can synthetically create a bond index, well, I, I've got actual bonds that I can, you know, use as a physical bond to create that index. Whereas a VIX it's a theoretical mathematical construct to measure risk. So you have these products out there that are designed basically to go up or down with the VIX and they're actually leveraged some of these products, which is even, even more crazy to even think about. Um, but so what happened was, in my opinion, was you have these, these, these leveraged uh, VIX products and they're designed to go to mimic, you know, if the VIX goes up, then they appreciate and they have to match that index or their NAV to match that VIX. Or if they go down, they have to match that and, and sell VIX and, and push the price down. So then vice versa. But these ETNs, and it's weird, it's it's like a move, you know, from the VIX back, you know, VIX would used to be normally, I would say probably in the 20s, maybe 15 to 20, that might be a normal VIX. And when you get like a, a, a 50% move, you know, it, it, it moves, you know, from if you're at 15 and a 50% move would be up to like 22 and a half, right? You know, so you'd get a spike in VIX, but that's only a 50% move. But when you, move, when you, when the VIX gets down to like eight or nine to have a a hundred percent move is not kind of out of the realm. You know what I mean? So when we talk about a byproduct of all this central bank debt printing and all these asset valuations crushing volatility, well, the cost of it is you're skewing the market, right? You skew the market for risk because realistically, you're, you're, you, there, there is no volatility. You've crushed it. You've taken it all out of the market. So the move from, and these, and these ETNs and ETPs and, and they, they, they they have these products designed around these, this VIX and they have what's called like a, like a threshold, like an automatic liquidation threshold. And it's 80% move in one, one day, right? Well, who would think the VIX can move 80%? Well, if it's trading 20, you know, it's going to have to move up to 36. So that's not out of the realm, but it's kind of unhistorically, you know, possible. But when it's trading eight and it moves to 16, that's not that crazy. You're starting at such a low artificial point that I don't think people really took that into considerate consideration. So these products are designed, if that thing moves 80%, they have to shut down because they can't afford losing more than 100%, right? Because then you got lawsuits 
And you know what I mean? So that's why they have that 80% threshold because they're hoping that they can not lose any more than that. And so by the end of that day on Friday, I think it was Friday. I think it, it, it moved pretty, pretty big, but I don't think they hit their threshold at that point. I think this was on the Monday, right? I can't remember the exact day. It was the Monday or the Tuesday, but it moved enough to where by the end of the day, I know the the XIV was like closed at 99, whatever on their NAV was 99 bucks. But in the aftermarket, um, the VIX futures started, uh, right. You know, they had to buy these VIX futures because it was blowing out. So, you know, there, and you can't do the VIX futures, not liquid enough to buy 250,000 of them. You just can't do it. You're going to, you're going to push that thing. You're going to almost be it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You're going to almost inevitably take yourself out by force of liquidation. There was no way, there was no way that they could get out of this position and, and survive. So they knew the liquidation was coming. Somebody knew because then they would just short sell that XIV at 99 and all the way down by the time it closed. And then by the time it reopened at four o'clock, um, I, I think it opened at 20. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there was no way any, any retail investor was able to get out. So it closed that day at, at 99. I think it was the Monday. And by the time it reopened at four o'clock and it was all over CNBC, they had it up there. They're like, well, this, this thing's NAV should be down at five bucks because of their, their liquidation 80%. And that's exactly what happened, right? You know, they lost everything, but there was no way anybody would have gotten out. But that was a systemic cause, systemic risk to, to blow out that afternoon uh, based upon these positions that had to be forcibly liquidated. So, and, and when you liquidate one fund like that and you do that, then you, you, there's other ones that are tied to it, right? So now I mentioned LJM just before, and I'm not trying to pick on them for any reason, but yeah, they were essentially just a, a fund which were trading uh, these VIX related products, correct? Like, like the, they weren't the fund actually. What's the word? Yeah, they're yeah. not XIV. No, XIV. That 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 that's an ETN. That's run. I think it's run by Sockgen. Don't quote me, but on that I guess maybe I should not say that because it might not be them, but. I'm pretty sure it was a sock gen that, that ran, ran the XIV. Okay. Uh, um, but no, LGM had their own mutual fund, the preservation and growth fund, which was a short volatility fund, right? So you're, you're, I'm assuming, um, I've never read their prospectus, but I'm assuming uh, they're option writers on volatility. Okay. And that's what caused them to come unstuck. Well, yeah, I'm assuming they, I'm assuming without, I don't know their positions, but, um, uh, you know, if they're in the VIX futures at all and they're, they're short those things because they're short volatility that they're as the, as the market VIX is, uh, blowing out then they're short that, that future and they can't get out. And that's one leg of the trade. The other leg is obviously in the options market. If you're short, you know, volatility options, not only, you know, on, on the VIX future, but in, in the, in the, on the CBOE market and S and P market as well. You know, as you're shorting all the volatilities, well, as the market blows out, let's, you know, it, it could do it on the upside, which was weird, Aaron, not to change the subject, but volatility was increasing as the market was making new highs. What that, what, now that's really strange because what they're doing is they're reaching for calls then, you know, like they're, they're actually forcing the market up and volatility is increasing as it's moving higher, which isn't, I don't want to say is it out of the realm of norm normalcy, but you know it generally d didn't do that, and that just happened. You know, like at the end of January, that started to happen, and then we get the fall back in early February, and people don't think. You know, I I, I always say options writing's you know dangerous, and it's like picking pennies up in front of the steam lower, steamroller because it works, it works, and then you just get wiped out. So. You know, and it's unfortunate because it doesn't have to happen. Um, there should be risk metrics in place to stop. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about, refining an algorithm. And, and it, it's all of that. It's not just execution on trades. It's, it's par risk parameters, which I view as equally important. So I, I think they just got caught because um, I think they did very well for a few years in a row or six or seven years in a row. And I guess if it's not broke, why fix it? And you just just keep rolling with it. But, you know, once I said, once again, this is a product of the central bank driven complacency because you lull these people into thinking volatility can never spike because the, the Fed's there to mop everything up. Well, you know, a move from eight to 20 in the VIX isn't a big deal now. You know, it, it's like it can happen, you know, so so it's unfortunate. It's the way some of these products designed. I guess the SEC could be blamed. I mean, I see how much rules and regulations and scrutiny I get as a CTA. I can't believe that the SEC allows uh, short leveraged, uh, 
funds on the VIX because it just, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not protecting the retail investor. You know what I mean? Yeah, the XIV, the XIV went from like five bucks to 160. Well, now it's nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was a great, you, you've made some really huge returns, but it's worthless. You know, it's designed to go to zero. Yeah. Now you were talking about risk parameters uh, for a, a brief moment there. Let, let's go into that a little more. When you talk about risk parameters, how does that fit in with what you're doing? Like, what are some of the parameters which you perhaps use? I think a lot of what gets taken away in the high frequency, you know, that everything is now in the way that I, I, you know, and you're involved in that. So you probably know more than I do about it. But um, how I think they disregard contract size a lot and, 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 and more or less look at it almost like a binary construct of assets. So you're more, you know, I think in the high frequency side, you're just looking at two numbers, let's just say, and you're just the interaction between those two. Whereas I, and I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but the way that I do it is I take a specific contract and, and, and I'll look at its volatility and I'll say, well, what am I trying to do? What's my goals here? Where are my risks? And I'll make sure that, that the parameters are set so they're not, you know, they can't be too tight, right? You can't just, you're not going to generate alpha if things are too tight because you're just, ne- you're never going to do it. There is always risk. And that's another thing that people need to understand. You're not, you're not going to make money unless you risk money. That's the bottom line. So. Um, you can squeeze out the alpha and tighten everything up and delta neutral everything, but you're not going to go anywhere. You know, I, I understand that. And I understand that, you know, there are, there is risk, but you need to define it even before you trade or even before you make that trade and entry levels are key to that. So when I'm, when I'm, when I'm designing a risk parameter, I'm not only looking at like the entry level that I'm trying to get in at, but I'm looking at my overall risk based upon that entry level. And it sometimes may cause me to, to refrain from actually putting that on because it might say, well, this risk isn't a lot, you know, you might, you're going to need to take extra, you're going to have to, you know, risk it to this level. And I might not want to risk it to that level. So then it'll say, okay, well, you, you need to maybe wait or, or cut your size. You know, you can risk 33% here, or you can wait and risk one and a half percent based upon adjusting your size. So something like that, where you're, you know, before you do it exactly where your outs are. And if they get there, you know exactly whether or not you need to pull the trigger and say reevaluate. So I always thought you you have to kind of define those things because you're just flailing in the wind if you don't, you know, and I'm not, that's not to knock like instinctual traders, you know, if they're still out there, like you can do that. Like, you know, okay, well, I know if it gets here, I'm going to just get out. Well, innate human mentality, that's, that's, it's a hard thing to kind of fool, you know, I'd rather be kind of uh, parameterized where it's like, okay, I know if it gets here, then this is, this is what it's going to happen. When you talk about these levels as though if it gets here, like how are you thinking about, like how are you deciding where that particular level is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge technical guy as well as fundamental. Um, obviously, I, I'm, I, I know the fun, I have a fundamental viewpoint of the market. Um, but also on a technical side, um, I'm a big moving average guy. I'm a big Fibonacci guy. And because I think those, those two together do a relatively good job of, of amassing an overall viewpoint of not only congestion, but overall cheapness or richness to something. I think it's an, they, they, they prove to have some very good exhaustive levels and, um, Fibonacci, Fibonacci does very, you know, it's, it's throughout nature. So which I'm a big fan of correlating nature with everything and and numbers. And, you know, so I follow that. And so with that, I'll do a trade setup based upon those, those, you know, as long as the fundamentals are in line with what I want to do, I'll look at those and I'll set up the parameters. I'll say, well, you you can be long here, but this is your risk. And then if, if the risk is too much, then I have to, you know, the next parameter is to like, I have to adjust size to accordingly or do nothing and wait and see, you know, so it's all about trade entry for me because all too often than not, I find, you know, you can be right on the, the call, but if you're in too early, you can, you know, the, the, the algorithms will sniff you out in some form. And it's not just me. It's, it's, they know what everyone's looking at. They know what levels everyone's looking at and they'll push it. If I had the most money, that's what I would do. It's not insider trading. It's just, I have the most capital. So I'll just move it where I want to. So, but for general traders like me out there, I'm more or less looking for the trend. I'm looking for a good level to get in at, and I'm looking for fundamental backups for it. And in general, I like to look at the moving average and Fibonacci's for that. And I'll take volume into consideration because 
that's a big part of this too, but a lot of it's churn volume. So there's a lot of noise with that. You know, I'm, I'm not a trend follower. I don't want to say that. Like I'm not waiting for a breakout to put something on. I'd rather be proactive and have set parameters and set risk. That's kind of how I do it. Yeah. Now you mentioned moving averages and Fibonacci. Is that the extent of your technical analysis? Like, does it go any deeper or do you just like to keep things simple that way? Um, hmm. Does it? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of historicals to it too, though. I mean, you know, it's not just those levels. It's, it's, it's looking at it and, you know, trying to, because it's an art form, you know, there's nothing concrete about it. Um, and I can't really tell you why something stands out to me or why it doesn't, you know, sometimes it will, sometimes it'll be like, just like a light bulb will be like, Hmm, they're holding it here. Why are they holding it here when they shouldn't? And you know, something like that. Um, so that's where the discretionary part comes in, um, which is good. And that's kind of what I want to have that because I want to believe in the position. So, um, because if you don't believe in it, you'll get waffled out in no time. And that's the worst thing that can happen. Then you get, you know, you get flipped around and then you're short when you want to be long and long when you want to be short. And then you just kick yourself in the ass. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you just get churned up. So, yeah, to the, I, yeah, I don't want to say it's as easy as that, but I, I kind of don't want, you're right. I don't want to complicate it. Once I have the parameters in place, if, if those technicals line up with my fundamental viewpoint, I'm just pulling the trigger. And cause I know there's nothing left to it. it. It's, it's either goes my way or it doesn't. It's either, you know, I always give myself three options. You buy, sell or do nothing. So, uh, you know, I, I don't really want to complicate it more than that. And I think for the listeners, you know, I think if they've listened to the other podcasts, it's like, I probably trade, you know, 15 to 20% of the time and research, you know, the other 80% of the time, because it's just, that's not my game. It's never been my game, to be honest. You know, I just was never that kind of trader. Yeah. Now, now, as you do put a big emphasis on the fundamentals, and like you just said there, you, you like to spend a lot of time researching, one of the things which I think uh, probably holds true is that depending on what your, what your belief or your outlook is, I mean, you can always find supporting evidence to kind of- To match your, match your hypothesis? Exactly, yeah, back each side, depending on what that is. Uh, I mean, how do you decide what to leave? It's like an your astrophysicist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. What uh, What was the question? Like, how do you decide what leads your decisions? Like, you obviously spend a lot of time looking at different uh, research. How do you decide what you're going to give weight to and what not, and try not to let your, uh, I guess, bias override the the facts that are in front of you, if they are facts, of course. I think the discretionary nature comes after I, I, I kind of look at things and the parameters are all set up and it's, and, and it's like, okay, so I got to buy, buy bias. But, you know, like you just said, I could find anything that say, okay, look, we're starting a, a war starting. Maybe I should be long crude oil. Well, yeah, that's kind of a, a fundamental, but, but, you know, that's a, that's a black and white kind of situation, but that doesn't mean everything's leading to oil should rise. Right. I mean, you know, there's a lot more that goes into it and that could be just, fast money wanting to get in there knowing that we were going to drop bombs or something and it was long on Friday. And then you look at today, oil's down a buck or something, you know? So yeah, I, I, I guess you just don't really know, um, or I don't really know. I, I, I don't want to conform my bias. Actually, I let the market tell me what, what it wants to do. Like, I'm not going to get in front of it. Like the bonds here there, I, I think they can't raise rates, but like I said, I know they're going to. So to make a long bond call, on a bullish side is very tough for me because I can't be convicted to that. It's almost like you have, I know we're, I know rates are going to be back down to zero at some point in my life, but it's not right now. And the bonds are overvalued considered considering the feds hawkish. So, you know, my conviction there is, it, you know, the time frame in the short, short term is, is bearish, but in the long term, I'd rather be long U S rates, but you know, that's not right now. But, um, so that's a situation where my bias isn't swaying me to actually find the data that's telling me to buy it because I know in the long run, I, that is my bias, but in the short term, I'm kind of bearish, you know? Mm, okay. Now, I want to ask you a question, Mike, just for the fun of it. I think this will be kind of interesting to hear uh, your response, but let's just say if we enter a major bear market, okay? So, if the US equity market and the, the following markets just sort of fall off a cliff, in some ways, or maybe not even fall off a cliff, but just start to enter a, mm -hmm. a solid bear market. How would you position yourself or structure a trade 
to best capitalize on this? Oh, if I see like if I see the Nasdaq finally break like below like six fifty eight hundred or something, and we stay below there for like a month, let's just say that, and I know we're in a bear market, that you sell you sell rallies. Then you can't be fully convicted short, right? Because it never goes down straight. It, it, you know, y- you'll get you'll get massive rallies, and that's when you you reshort it. So. Like right now, I'm kind of I, I'm in that mentality, to be honest, Aaron. I think the S&Ps are in trouble, and but they're not going to go straight down. So like here, I would I would wait for a pop to 27, 25 or something in the June future to sell it. I wouldn't sell it here. It's up 20 something today, but I wouldn't be short it. It's probably going much higher. Um, but you cannot play bear markets. Um, the best way to do it, I think, is let's see to give your listeners the best way that I would do it. So you're just from a fundamental viewpoint, I would be I would be long calls close to the strike of the future. And if it popped above there, I would sell extra futures. <laughs> if that's if that sounds weird. <laughs> yeah. Can you just dumb that down and simplify your, your rationale there a little bit? I would I I would try to get short by being long calls to sell the futures. So I'm taking a, a very a, this is a safe approach to do it. You, you could you could buy close nearby. Now you, do, can I not use options or uh, use whatever you like? <laughs> okay, so I'd be lo- I'd be long. I, I on on big down days I would buy S and P calls like near term, maybe 25 handles away, 20 handles away from wherever it settled. And like let's let's say S and P dropped like 100 handles, I, I would probably buy 20 handles up strike calls, and then I would sell um, uh, futures against them probably like not two to one maybe 1.5 to one extra futures and short the market that way because i always feel like you're going to get that way it gives you a set you have a set risk right your the options are when you buy them it's just what you pay so there's really you know your risk it's x amount of portfolio and when you sell futures against if you're doing one to one there's really no risk if you're long calls above the strike so um that's a good way though to capture extra volatility on the downside if they do do move um, but I generally want to sell spikes if, if they're, or buy puts on spikes. You could do it both ways. You could buy puts on spikes too. I would never sell in the hole. You know, I wouldn't sell on a down a hundred day. That's for sure. I'd be looking to buy it actually, even though I know we're going down. If I thought it was a bear market, I wouldn't sell in the hole because you just, you're just putting yourself at risk for that big 50 to 70 handle rip. And you know, not many people can withstand that, but they'll do it. And it happens. I mean, we're up 25 today. What, what, on what? James Comey's book is crappy? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. You know, but I think that, but that's where correlating with other markets, you know, who's been the biggest recipient so far of this QE? You know, obviously, German interest rates have been the largest, I think, recipient. But, you know, if, if the equity markets fall, they're still going to get their money, right? So you got to pound the equity markets, whether it be in Germany or here. You know, or even the Nikkei, but uh, the BOJ buys everything up. So that's a tough force to fight, too. So that's what we're up against. You know, can the market go down? It can, but it'll be a slow death, I think. It's not going to be this big uh, lose, you know, 60% in three months. That's not going to happen. I don't want to say that. It it might happen, Aaron. I don't ever want to be like that. It may happen, but I would be hard pressed for the central banks to not step in every single time. Yeah, yeah. No, you can never be certain, that's for sure. Now, let's just say this this scenario did play out. What do you think would happen to crypto markets? I know you've been uh, fairly involved in actively tracking those and even participating in those. I mean, we've sort of run out of time to speak about that a little bit. But yeah, how do you think they would be impacted if equity markets uh, fall away? I think they would go down initially. Um, just because they're they're a risk asset, right? And anybody involved in it, if they have to come up with collateral somewhere, they're going to sell crypto. But I think overall, they're not correlated. They're on a general short-term time frame. Even Jeff Gunlock was talking about how they're somewhat correlated. Maybe the Bitcoin leads the market, and you know, and the and the Bitcoin has risen from its lows, just like the S and P has. So I, I see that. So if we're going to fall, then the Bitcoin and cryptos are going to fall. And not all of them, just the main players, because there are some of the other altcoins that will not not participate. But no, I think I think if equity, equity markets fall, crypto falls. And But I think crypto will rebound first. 
I think it's the future, to be honest. I, I, you know, decentralized applications is the future, and whether finance likes it or fiat currencies like it. And I always tell people, like, don't va- you can't look at the stuff in the fiat currency. Don't value it that way. Value in its utility function of what it does. And we're not even there yet. The companies that are going to be, you know, the Googles of crypto and blockchain aren't even out yet. I don't think so. This is just a just the it's it's still in the incubator phase. You know what I mean? Which is weird because I mean Bitcoin's eight thousand bucks and everyone's calling for doomsday and I'm like, yeah, well it was a thousand bucks a year ago, so exactly, eight grand. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all relative. But what's also strange though about Bitcoin is, you know, I, I told a lot about people about it years ago, you know, and you know, very astute investors and they're like, well, it's 300 bucks. What, you know, we'll just see how it goes. And they, none of them get into it, but they, they call me when it's 10 grand saying, is it too late to get in? <laughs> and I'm like, you're not going to buy it at, at, at two grand or 200 bucks, but you're going to buy it at 10 grand. I go, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, strange it, how that works, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why markets are the way they are. Human psychology is, is unpredictable sometimes or irrational, irrational, I should say irrational. Yeah. And I mean, over the past couple months, even more than, you know, what we've seen uh, in the past, there's been a lot of talk about government regulation and, you know, countries all around the globe uh, towards uh, crypto currencies. Does that concern you in any way for the future of uh, how these crypto markets will grow? Uh, No, because there's too much money to be made in it. And anytime you have that, the the one bloods in the water the sharks will come right so the big players are coming i mean you just had last weekend george soros saying you want to get involved with it and they're they're going to start you know getting into it which they probably already had if they're saying they they want to get into it that means they're already long um and even rockefeller's group so no i think i think countries that do that are harming themselves and we've seen great progress here in the states. Um, you know, Wyoming um, has passed a bunch of legislation that's pro blockchain. Um, and there's a lot of great people doing some awesome work in there, like Caitlin Long of Symbian. She, uh, she was formerly of Symbian, formerly, I think, of Morgan Stanley um, director. So she's instrumental in changing some of these states' viewpoints on this. And I think the US will get it. I, I think they understand it's going to be a viable asset class. So you know, I, I don't want to say it can't go to zero, but I, I don't see it ever doing that. I think the upside is unlimited and the uses and potentials are unlimited in the blockchain space. So um, I think countries that try to limit it are going to be left behind. And I think the U.S. is trying to figure out how to regulate it in some way, which I think is a good. It's good. Right. It, it, it adds some viability to it. And, um, you know, now that the IRS is involved with it and which they should be, because, you know, if you're making money on something, then, you know, the U.S. wants to tax you. So all these things you will know, upset the the base Bitcoin crypto user because it's, you know, it's more of a centralized form at that point. But you know what? It's it's if that's what it takes to make the asset class viable, I'm all for it. It's just countries that try to think they can ban it or regulate, you can't. And that's the good thing about cryptocurrency. It doesn't exist. I, I say it, it's everywhere and nowhere because it is. You can't stop it. It doesn't exist anywhere. You can't just go in the shut down a few computers. You can't do it. You know what I mean? And that's basically inherent of its design. That's why it's designed the way it is. So nobody can do that. So, um, but now you're running into situations where you're getting like ASIC miners, trying to, um, you know, take over control of the uh, core of some of these coins. And, you know, and that th- these are adjustments that are going to have to be made. And but these are all all ongoing adjustments that are going to, you know, advancing the ecosystem. So, you know, these are all good things. And I think Mt. Gox was the beginning of the bad, really bad, like, you know, this is what could happen. And, you know, you get e- inefficiencies are eventually taken out, you know, and you have an advancement of a of a of a technology, which is what it is. Bitcoin and blockchain is a technology. Yeah. Well, Mike, we better leave it there. But um, next time, next time I have you on, we'll have to um, we'll have to get stuck into cryptocurrencies um, right from the get go because um, I think there's a lot we can talk about there. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to do a separate one, yeah. Maybe after the CTA is up and I get a little more time, then we'll we'll discuss. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Now. Uh, I know if anyone's interested, they can uh, find out more about you or follow along with your material. I know you write a newsletter for Capital Trading Group and maybe even yourself as well. Uh, if someone wants to read that, where's the best place to go? Um, you can go to Capital Trading Group and under the uh, weekly 
um, commentary section, they'll have a subscribe link. And then, and then also I, I do put it up on the blog like a week later, uh, which is econemotions.com. That's my blog. Um, and it'll go up there like a week later because Capital Trading Group has kind of exclusivity to it um, for their subscribers. So, uh, but I do put it up on my blog a week later. So, or a couple days actually. Yeah, that, that newsletter, just to clarify, it's completely free for anyone to read, isn't it? Yeah, it's completely free. And it's two. Sometimes, uh, well, I don't always put out a cryptocurrency weekly one, um, but I generally try to um, just to capture some of the action. So it's mostly uh, I'll do a global weekly newsletter and then a, uh, I call the Crypto Corner is my uh, weekly crypto newsletter. Okay, cool. And of course, I'll put links to uh, these uh you know, your blog and the Capital Trading Group uh, website where they can subscribe uh, in the show notes as well. Awesome. Uh, now, Mike, have you changed your Twitter handle or have you got the same one still? Yeah, no, it's an Econ Emotions. So, it's uh, e- at Econ Emotions. At Econ Emotions. That's your Twitter handle. E-C-O-N-E-M-O-T-I-O-N-S. Yeah. Okay, great. Hitting bids. Yeah, and I got a, my little uh, icon is the... Lewis uh, uh, Winthorpe and uh, Valentine. <laughs> What's that from, from trading uh, places? From, from trading places. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right, man. I appreciate you coming back onto the podcast. It's been an absolute blast. Thank you very much, Mike. All right, Aaron. Cheers, man. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. Chat with Traders.